Welcome back. You're listening to Across the Border. That's the name of this broadcast. I'm Nicholas, and we're continuing here our study in the Ecclesiastes. Um, we left off at uh, chapter 3 and verse 18, where the preacher, uh, one Solomon, he says, he continues here, his vein of thought, I guess. He said, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and they might see that they themselves are beasts. Yes, we are akin to the animals. We are like the animals in a lot of ways. You see a lot of the same design features in the beasts out there of the field as, as we have in our own body. He continues, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them all. As one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. Now that sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? As, uh, as, uh, as my friend would say, man and other animals. <laughs> But there is a difference. But he says, well, in death, you know, man has no preeminence above a beast. Because the man dies, the, the beast dies. As the beast dies, the man dies. We all have one breath. Yes, we're all breathing the same atmosphere out here, aren't we? He says, all is vanity. They all go to one place. All are of the dust. And all turn to dust again. From dust you came, to dust you shall return. Verse 21, now we start getting to the difference here. There is a difference, and it's, uh, it's huge. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So we're talking about how the beast and the man are alike. They both have the same breath. They both die, but the spirit of the man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes downward to the earth. So the spirit of animals returns to the earth from where it came, just like their body. The body of the animal returns to the earth, and so does ours. But our spirit does not go to the earth because our spirit is not from the earth. Our spirit is not from this creation. Our spirit is from outside this creation. We were made in the image of the Almighty. So we have a spirit that is not of this world. We have a spirit of a place that is outside of creation. He continues, Wherefore I perceive there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Uh, taking no thought for tomorrow. And of course, we're commanded at the same time to, uh, to, it, to store up an inheritance for our, uh, says a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So circumspectly. And that's how we're to interpret all of the, the scripture, circumspectly. <clears throat> there are different ways of interpreting the scripture. And I'll draw some illustrations. And, uh, and you can do this. I'm not pointing to anyone specifically when I draw these illustrations because everything is common to man. And uh, so you can, you can uh, strictly interpret the scripture. Let's say the, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. We'll use that for an illustration. And say we're going to strictly interpret the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Okay? Rather than interpret it circumspectly and that means to take in to account the whole of scripture to use the whole of scripture to interpret scripture itself uh, we don't cut and paste we take the whole scripture we don't we don't pick a part to interpret another part and leave off everything else that's not circumspect taking in the whole okay but to strictly interpret, say, the commandment. You're going to interpret this one verse strictly. And we're going to say, thou shalt not kill. Well, that means you can't kill anything at all. And you, you could say, well, we've discovered, as we've just discovered, that, you know, that life 
things that are living for the purpose of thou shalt not kill. Um, otherwise, you couldn't eat if you believe that vegetables had the breath of life. Um, you couldn't even kill vegetables to eat. So we say, well, everything that has the breath of life, that's what we apply thou shalt not kill to. Because we have to define our terms when we're talking about laws and commandments. We have to know what we're talking about, right? So all the terms have to be c confirmed. So thou shalt not kill means that you shall not kill anything that has the breath of life. So if we interpret that scripture, that, that scripture strictly, that means that we cannot even eat animal flesh because we have to kill the animal to eat it. See, that would be a strict interpretation. So there are people that like to apply a strict interpretation to some scriptures or some commandments, but not to others. And that's not being very consistent, to, be, to put it nicely. Uh, and to put it uh, in so, not so nice terms, we could say that they're double-minded because they want to interpret some things strictly, but they want to interpret other things circumspectly. So say they, you have the Seventh-day Adventists, I guess they're strict interpreters of the commandments because they want to follow and interpret everything strictly so that they won't even eat meat. But now if we take if we interpret that circumspectly, we realize that what we had to, in order to follow other commandments, statutes, and judgments in the same, by the same lawgiver, that that would require killing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that would require killing animals for the sacrifice and to eat, because they ate the, you know, the sacrifice is eaten. Uh, the lawful parts, the parts that were told to eat and the parts that were not told to eat, some were burned in the fire or whatever, or the blood was spilled out upon the ground because it goes, the life is in the blood and it goes back to the earth. So to strictly interpret that, they couldn't even eat meat, but by the same lawgiver gives us commandments, statutes, and judgments, it says we're supposed to sacrifice animals and eat them. As a matter of fact, he even said after the flood to Noah, he says, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, what do you, how, what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm going to paraphrase it, my understanding. He said, Noah, you know, you've been, the, the clean animals that you brought, uh-huh, and you brought them for the sacrifice. He said, now you can have that meat, that clean meat, as a regular part of your diet. Because he didn't throw out the law. He would have had to add that caveat. Because a lot of people will go back to that and say, look, he told Noah he could eat pig. No, I'm sorry. Noah didn't start eating pig. And you see no change in, in attitude or behavior. You just see a reestablishment of the law with Moses. It was codified or in written form with Moses. So a strict interpretation would say that you can't kill. But we have a circumspect interpretation which says that we're required to kill, that for murder at the hand at at the hand of man it, the life of man will be required and that was also given to noah and that's the capital punishment statute it means that a man if 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 someone kills another man they are to be judged by man and if they're found guilty of murder because then the heavenly father the almighty gave us case law in his word too so that we could judge between premeditated murder we could judge between that and say manslaughter involuntary manslaughter or negligent manslaughter and there were different judgments and punishments but for premeditated murder and and some negligent murder depending on the motive and, uh, they were judged to that they were required to execute capital punishment so they were required to kill by the law they were required to kill animals by the law so we re we interpret thou shalt not kill circumspectly using taking into account the whole word and that's how we're to interpret the whole word of God is circumspectly so even here wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works for that is his portion for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? And so when we read things 
anywhere in the scripture that seem to say one thing if we interpret it strictly well we have to realize that we're to interpret the whole word of God that's the example we have just from the thou shalt not kill statute or commandment that we are to interpret that circumspectly and that goes with the well, we can go to the first commandment thou, or the second commandment about making graven images thou shalt not make any graven images to bow down and worship them okay so some will say strictly well you can't have any graven images you know you can't have an image of anything and it doesn't just say of animals it says anything that is in heaven above that is in the earth beneath that is under the sea that is on the earth you can't make an image of anything but it adds to bow down and worship them and then you turn around and you find that the, that the almighty when he gave the instructions to build the temple for the temple service and the tabernacle in the wilderness he instructed them to you know we went through this when we went through uh let's see what is it ezra and uh yeah ezra i believe it was and where they were command they were given the commandments to rebuild the temple and also in leviticus and deuteronomy where they were given the instructions in the wilderness or in exodus to build the first tabernacle in the wilderness they were instructed to make graven images yeah so so we see a difference there that yes graven images are allowed but we're not allowed to worship them to bow down and worship them so we we're interpreting this the second commandment there circumspectly realizing that we we have graven er images all around us everything is a graven image you know if we make a record an audio it's a great it's a graven image of something that the Almighty created and that is sound videos pictures they're graven images of the something that the Almighty made and created and they're graven images yes they are but do we bow down and worship them that's the question now even worse than graven images of things that the Almighty has created that we can see with our eyes like animals and beasts and sounds and pictures and and video and graven images are the images of things that we can't see with our eyes like did you know that that the Almighty that Yahuwah has a kingdom or government in heaven yeah it's a government so men have made an image of government on earth and those are good you know there are good governments out there that men have created in the image of his government okay and those images that are good those government images made by men that are good are in, in compliance with the law of the Almighty now when they become a bad image is when they raise themselves up above or engage in licentious licentiousness and that is they license by statute by the laws of men that which is unlawful by the law of the Almighty and that and then when people obey that and use that licentious licentiousness as a license to do evil then they are worshiping the image of the beast and they are engaged in idolatry because they are worshiping and bowing down to an image made by man and those are the most uh, those are the worst images of all they're the ones that can't be seen with eyes that aren't graven images so there are worse images than graven images and those are the governments of men which are made in the image or made as an image of his government but then legislate licentiousness and theft through programs like insurance and social security and allowing abortions and 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 glossing over uh, adultery and allowing sodomy and people who use that as an excuse to engage in those things or allow those things or not come against those things but to accept them are engaged in worshiping the image of the beast and that is a government out of control that is not in compliance with the Almighty's government which is in heaven his law is not a heavy burden and I love this illustration because it drives it home what I'm talking about 
I can hold his law in my hand. I've got the book, you know, the, the King James Version of the Bible. I can hold it in my hand, and I can read it all, and I can know it, and I become intimate with it, and it's not heavy. I can hold it. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. I can read it, and I can understand it, and he teaches me obedience in it. And it's not a heavy burden. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now compare that with the laws of men. That every day you get up, I don't care who you are. You're breaking some law of men somewhere of the legislature. Because they have hundreds of thousands. They pass a law and, you know, it has more pages than the Bible. The Patriot Act has more pages than the Bible. I mean, they had to bring it in with a hand truck. And nobody read it, and they passed it. And now we're all under it? <laughs> and we pay, they pay these, uh, the governments of men, they, they pay these men, to go, these legislators, legislators, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year each to go up there and lay more heavy burdens on the people. And then they legislate that you have to buy certain services from certain people. Services that are unlawful according to God's law. They've legislated wickedness. But the law of God says, I'm not supposed to participate in those things. Who am I going to obey? You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who are you going to obey? Daniel. You know, we would need more Daniels out there. Are you a Daniel? Or you just say, well, it's the law. I have to do it. Uh, there's a higher law. Let every soul be subject to the higher law power and what's the higher power fear not them that can kill the body but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell that's the higher power the high power that lasts forever they may be able to kill your body but we're not supposed to fear them so even at the point of death that's the example from daniel shadrach meshach and abednego all the apostles and all of the prophets that's the examples we're not to fear them that can kill the body and most people fear much less they fear the policeman on the side of the road may steal their car or they may lose their job and their livelihood if they obey God's law and recant man's law. Well, people fear much less than having their life, forfeiting their life to be obedient to the kingdom of heaven which lasts forever. They fear what is temporary. They fear losing what they really treasure, the things of this world and this life, which they must leave behind. They have no choice. You have to leave those things behind. You cannot take them with you. That's why the Messiah instructed us to store up our treasures in heaven where they can't be stolen, where they can't be corrupted. And all we have to do is endure in his kingdom to the end of our mortality. And only if we are in his kingdom, when our mortality comes, when, when the end of our mortality comes, then we will be in his kingdom forever. But if we're not in his kingdom, and if we don't endure to the end, if we turn back from the plow at any time, as the master illustrated, then we lose it all. We forfeit everything that we stored up, whatever treasure we may have had, we lose that because we've chosen to turn back from the plow and we've decided we're going to pay the price for our own sins. Why would anyone do that? Why would any sane person do that? So I can say that people who don't accept the Messiah, who don't accept the deal and, and enter into his kingdom and allow his Holy Spirit to convict them of sin and teach them obedience, they're all insane. There's a, there's a measure of insanity there. Cross the border into his kingdom and live forever repent as the master put it for the kingdom is at hand it's within your grasp reach out grab it and start walking and endure crucifying the deeds of the flesh becoming a lawful inhabitant a lawful citizen of heaven by learning obedience so the spirit of man goeth upward and the spirit of the beasts that goeth downward to the earth we're in ecclesiastes chapter 22 wherefore i perceive that there is nothing better that a man should rejoice in his own works for for that is his portion for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him 
Well, the Almighty, He has revealed it to us. What shall be after us? He's given us prophecy. We know. And so the question is, there, there is the answers in the book to who shall bring him to see what is after him. The Almighty brings us to see. He shows us that we can store up treasure in eternity and cross over and receive a glorified body when we go through the, the death of mortality and rise from the dead by the power of his blood and receive a body like he had that will never die, that will never grow old, that will never get sick forever and will enjoy all those treasures that we can't even count today. Treasures untold, stored up in, his, in, his, in the kingdom of heaven, in heaven forever. I believe that. He's shown me that that is true. And I know it's true. Just like you know that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. And you can know what I know. But only the Almighty can show it to you. I can't show it to you. I'm just telling you all about it. I'm just a messenger. I'm just giving you testimony about what's happened to me. And, and what I'm learning from his word. And I'm trying to share that to you the best I can. Because this is what he has given me to do. This is the labor that he has given me. And I am delighted and honored to have this labor. Chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, verse 1. So I returned and I considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such that were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressor there was power, but they had no comforter. We'll be back after some messages. Visit my website, crosstheborder.org. I would like to hear from you. So please, leave me a message there on the contact page. We'll be back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. listening to Cross the Border, we're going to continue here our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, having the root word ecclesi, ecclesia in the Greek, deriving the name from the Septuagint, which was um, the translation of this book 
into Greek from the Hebrew uh, about the third century BC, somewhere between two to three hundred years before the Messiah or before the Common Era, whichever way you want to have it. Uh, it's the old, old teaching dies hard, does it not, before the Messiah? But yeah, so you have several hundred years be BC, two to three hundred years BC, the Old Testament translated into Greek. So we get the title Ecclesiastes, and that's what it means. That's the same root word for ecclesia, which is translated church in the New Testament in the King James, authorized King James Version there. So a little more understanding. He calls himself the preacher, and this is the preacher speaking to the called out ones. That's what we have. So we see that the ecclesia, Greek, church, the true people, or Yahudi, for it, to use another word, which means the people of him, called by his name. So whenever you see that term, the people called by my name, think Yahudi, because those are the people called by his name. You know, it's like you, you hear people called by the names of men. You have, um, well, I can't think of any of those names, but They'll say something like, uh, what could I think, Lutherans. Yeah, there you go, Lutherans, people who are called by the name of Luther. Uh, and there's plenty of examples out there, just because my brain doesn't work that well, and I can't call up a dozen for you. I'm sure you could think of a few. But people that are called by the name of someone else. Um, so, for instance, many people were called by the name of their father, and they would be called Joseph's son or something like that, or Michaelson. You know, which means, uh, or Ben, whatever, because Ben meant son in the Hebrew. So if we're called by his name, then we are Yahudi, the people called by his name. That's literally what it means. We'll continue here. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such that were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power. So power corrupts, and power, people have power to oppress other power people. Like, I'm being oppressed right now, I have to admit it. These people are using the power of the courts <clears throat> and, their, and their ability to manipulate the courts to oppress me right now. So they... So I saw power on the side of the oppressors. There was power, and they have power to do evil because the Almighty gives you power to do evil. That's right. Um, you have the capacity to do evil. You have capacity to do evil against other people, to usurp authority. And so they use that power, whatever power they can, to oppress other people. And he says they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressors, there was power. They used the power to oppress, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than they both, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Um... Well, very, a very negative expression here. You know, it's better not to be alive, better to be dead than to be oppressed or to be the oppressor that has no remedy or no comfort. Absolutely true. But I have comfort in my oppression. And I see that my oppressors have no comfort at all because they're practicing evil. They're using power, the power that they have, to practice evil and to oppress others. And since the, the commandment says to me that not to re, repay evil for, for evil, but overcome evil with good. So I have to, I can't use what power or the same power they're using against me against them. But my comfort is obedience to the Almighty and practicing good and the treasures that I'm storing up in heaven. And uh, realizing that I'm in the courtroom already, and the court is set, and there is a uh, multitude of angels watching. 
what's going on and everything is being recorded in that record in heaven but for those that are being oppressed and have no comforter and those that are doing the oppressing that have no comforter he's saying it's better to be dead or better to not have been born wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead and more more than the living which are not yet alive yea better is he than they both they which hath not yet been who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun again I considered all the travail and every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor this is also vanity and vexation of spirit and that's you know that's why men want to steal or use power against other men to steal their labor because they envy their neighbor and they want more says so this is vanity vexation of spirit the fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh Ooh. the fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit it's nice to have comfort even even when you're going through oppression otherwise all you have is your hands full of travail and vexation of spirit I can't allow them to vex my spirit I feel it you know I still feel those things I feel the vexation but by faith I put it off and I look beyond it it's present it's there but somehow I'm above it I can feel it in my flesh and sometimes it it causes me anguish but somehow I find myself rising above it because I have comfort he sends his comforter to take me through everything and that's that's the example we have in the scriptures of all the prophets and all the martyrs of Yahshua Jesus all those that were martyred for their faith all the prophets that were martyred they were comforted with something that carried them through that Stephen as he was being stoned he was he rose above it somehow I'm sure he felt that anguish and that pain for a moment but somehow he was taken and he was carried above it and I expect if, if someday I'm martyred it could happen I see what's coming the mark of the beast system is rising up the technocracy is here all the players have taken their place the first beast the second beast and it's developing before my very eyes I know it's coming and I know I've done my study in the calendar what year is it the booklet is there it's published on my website at cross the border dot org for everyone to see and I know that it's all coming and it will all close within the, at least the next generation if not this one 60 years I see on the outside um, few less than that on the inside so I could live to see it maybe maybe not the, to see the seventh millennium dawn in my mortal existence here I may and I may not I think I would be blessed blessed to somehow live through all that's coming you know the final long great inquisition of and uh, I have a feeling that the final inquisition and the reign of the mark of the beast in its full reign is going to be about 40 years I just have that feeling because I see that that period of 40 years somehow keeps popping up there so and that was what you know the Messiah gave Israel after he separated them after he divorced them because he did divorce them he divorced an adulterous wife and but he gave them 40 years as a nation before the the final uh, destruction came to the nation in its fullness and the temple mount and Jerusalem and everything was destroyed 40 years from the time that he gave up the call the ghost on the cross and he said it is finished and the temple and the veil was rent from top to bottom that was about 28 29 in the, of the common era and about 69 70 of the same common era calendar 40 years later and then 40 years later yep that's it 40 years later um, the final destruction came like a flood just as foretold by Daniel the prophet and the Messiah 
Uh, I'm thinking this, it's going to be about 40 years that the full sway. So, you know, we have perhaps 10 to 20 years left before the fullness of the mark of the beast system comes in. But I also believe, and, and here we are, I pray the Heavenly Father, let your spirit of prophecy be upon me, Father, if I speak, that we're, gonna, we're in for, you know, those of us that live in the land of the second beast and the whole world, except for places here and there that uh, are going to be safe places. And I hope I'm in one of those. Uh, I want to be led by a spirit so that if I'm not in one, that I will be led to one of those safe places or that he will keep me safe wherever I am because I would like to endure it. But I see a great travail coming upon the earth. You know, a, a third world war. I see, I see the sword and famine coming to the land where I live. And I see great destruction coming. And, every, and I'm not the only one, so I'm not alone out here. You see that the, his prophets are, are speaking it. And a lot of them haven't, don't understand who the, beast, the beasts are. The second beast and the first beast identify. America is the second beast. Rome is the first beast. Because those beasts work together. The second beast exercises all the powers of the first beast before it. Doesn't, hasn't America done that? Exercise all the power of Rome? being the superpower you think there's a coincidence there that we use the term superpower the world's superpower because it exercises all the power of the roman empire before it and then it gives its power to the first beast and it causes everyone to worship the image of the first beast which it made didn't america make a worldwide governing body in the image of rome called the United Nations. So we've identified them. America is the second beast. Rome is the first beast. And the image is the United Nations. And Satan's monetary system, the mark of the beast monetary system, first trial run, the Federal Reserve in America. And now everybody's learning. Well, the Federal Reserve isn't federal. And it isn't American. And it has no reserves. Why, it's owned by a foreign banking cartel. How did that happen? Yeah, that was the trial run. Now they're destroying that, and they're going to build on the disasters and the things that are coming in the next 10 to 20 years. They're going to perfect Satan's monetary system, and it's going to be the mark of the beast because they have the technology now to employ it. So out of the disaster and the financial crisis that we're going through right now, which is just beginning, just beginning, go back and do your little study on the depression, the Great Depression in America. It went on for many years, and people were brought way low. And everybody had to turn to the image of the beast for relief. And it was all by design. And it's all by design now. And the mark of the beast monetary system is coming. Through all the travail of the financial crisis and the wars and the famines and the sword to come in the next 10 to 20 years, they're going to establish their final mark of the beast monetary systems. And yes, people will be executed who will not participate in the new social order. And those will be the elect who will finally, most of them are still living in a delusion right now but finally their eyes will be open and they will forfeit their lives at that time and those of us that have our eyes open now and can prepare and are being led by the spirit because his people are going to live through that time it's not a seven year tribulation rapture where you're going to be raptured out pre mid or whatever trib because there is no seven year tribulation that's all counter-reformation the eschatology that they've done to break you down and to do away with the resurrection of the dead the great hope of all the elect is the resurrection of the dead and they're just tearing it down step by step and over a seven-year period they hope to totally obliterate it because when they start their seven-year tribulation period by kicking off the rebuilding of the temple nobody's going to be raptured Three and a half years later, they're going to say, well, it must be mid-trib. 
And then when the three and a half years, four years passes by and everybody's going to look around and they're going to say, well, it wasn't mid-trib, it must be post-trib. So they've already torn it down with two steps. So nobody's going to be surprised after the seven-year tribulation period of the false prophecy when nobody's raptured out and they're going to say, well, gee, you know, you guys misunderstood. Haven't you learned by now that there is no rapture? See, they've changed the resurrection of the dead into a rapture and they're going to let you down slowly so that everyone will accept it at the end and accept the Antichrist because they put on a play and vanquish the false Antichrist. This is what's coming, people. This is what the Bible, this is what the book foretells. And this is what their false prophecy foretells. And so people are going to go, well, okay, well, that must be right. And they're going to give up their hope in the resurrection of the dead. And they're going to say, well, we get, at least we get to go to heaven when we die. <laughs> yes, indeed, we get to go to heaven when we die. You always have that assurance. But the elect, you know, throughout this process of the elect are going to start waking up. Well, the sooner you wake up, the better. You know, show me the gap. Go to my website, look for show me the gap there. And show me the gap. And you'll realize that the whole thing is false. This whole eschatology eschatological scheme of left behind in the late great planet earth is all false it was all invented by some jesuit priest four or five whatever how many hundred years ago and it's slowly been built and now it has full sway in all the corporate churches that are an image of the state yeah that's right they got their image of the state and thank you, Heavenly Father, for revealing to that to us. We're going to jump back into Ecclesiastes here. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So that's the comfort we have. That's how I got into the prophetic and and uh, the things that he has revealed to us about the future is that we have hope through it all regardless it's not vanity but if all we have if we have don't have the comforter through our oppression through the vexation of spirit if we're not able to rise above it by entering into his kingdom well it's all vanity and vexation of spirit there's one alone he continues here in verse 8 there's one alone and there's not one and there is not a second yea he that neither child nor brother yet is there no end of all la of his labor neither is his eye satisfied with riches neither saith he for whom do i labor and bereave my soul of good this is also vanity yea it is a sore travail two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall the one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And you know, the Master, the Messiah, he, he demonstrated this when he sent out his disciples. He sent them out two by two so that they could hold each other up and the spirit working together with them if one perchance had a weakness the other would be strong and check his brother and that's why the scripture says that we should not forsake the, sh the fellowship the gathering of ourselves together that there is strength in numbers and we need to hold each other up we need fellowship of the brethren it is e so easy to fall by yourself when you're alone so I grieve to be alone you know I, my wife died five years ago she was a good help me we could hold each other up and I have brethren now you know that I minister to and they minister to me whether they know it or not and I seek fellowship wherever I can seek it the gathering of ourselves together so that we can enjoy that fellowship and hold each other up and sometimes the, the Heavenly Father, He puts us in a desert. He allows us that desert so that we can understand these things that we're learning. The same desert that our friend here, Solomon, 
is writing about in Ecclesiastes that it's not good to be alone. He said it at the beginning. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a help meet suitable for him. So if one falls, the other lifts him up. But woe to him that is alone when he falls. And I know that woe because I've been alone and I've fallen. And it is difficult to get up. Again, if two lie together, they have heat. So then there's the practical thing about having a companion suitable. When two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And right now I don't have anyone to lie with me because I am celibate, not by my choice, but the Almighty, you know, the, the, Lord, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, it says in the authorized King James Version. And uh, for his purpose, he allowed my wife to be taken away. So will I lie alone and uh, tell you a little secret? I have heat in my bed. Yes, and it's, it's uh, brought there by electricity, and I am thankful for it. <laughs> it's still not the same thing. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, it still would be nice to have a helpmeet like my last wife was and someone that I delight to, to be with. I have not forgotten what that is like. And uh, anyone who has it, uh, should be blessed and don't take it for granted because it can be gone just like that and to stand when it's gone uh, that you need the strength of the Almighty and he gives us a comforter I mean, his Holy Spirit is a better comforter than a woman in the flesh that's right so but there is that practicality that he points there to about having heat together okay we'll continue and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So it's good to have people you can stand with, that you can call on, that you know you can rely on, that you have that fellowship in spirit with, that you can call upon and stand with them. And I thank, I thank the Almighty for the good brothers and sisters out there that have stood with me in good despite the oppression of others and uh, they have their reward and they will receive the reward because I, re I hope their reward is beyond any way that I'm able to help them that they're storing up the same treasure in heaven that I'm storing up and I, and I send that blessing by my word out upon them now and I pray it in the name of the almighty Yahuwah by the blood of his precious son and plus all of those out there that are listening and support this ministry in any way they can. I pray for you all and I lift you all up in his mighty name. And I say, Hallelujah. Visit my website, CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? 
Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.